So you may know that we're in the series that we're calling Why. Um, this is not a, a, a ministry highlight series. It, it's, it's really uh, an invitation for you to come and look over our shoulders as we look in the mirror. Um, what, what I told the folks who are speaking of the series is, you know, like, I, do we know who we are? Do we know why we do anything that we do? Are, are we just copying other churches? Are we copying those who came before us? Are, are we just mimicking best practices? Or do we actually mean what we do? And it, it's an opportunity, really, for us to explore why any of this stuff matters and what, what we think is the best expression of trying to see the kingdom come, to make sure that we're doing things that are in line with our, our values. Um, I think it's important to say that there's potentially a number of answers as to why we do anything, and that doesn't mean that any of them are right or wrong. If you ask our church why we worship, it might be different than why another church ends up as to why they worship. Um, that doesn't mean that we have the right answer and they have the wrong answer. Sometimes there's different motivations behind these things. I think it's very important that we actually understand what that is. And if you actually hear some of these sermons and you hear the, the reason that we do something, you're thinking, well, that's not why I would do that. <laughs> that doesn't line up for you. There's still space for you here. And I want you to hear that. Right, But what I wanted and what I hoped that we'd see is that we have um, the ministry leaders speak as to why they want to do the things that they're doing. Right, That way you're, you're hearing from people as to why this thing matters. And what you hope and what I think we've seen is everybody thinks that what they're talking about is the most important thing. <laughs> Right? Because that's the why. Because this is what matters. Because I, I've tasted and seen that there's the words of life here. Because I, I know whenever I do this, life makes more sense. Or life is richer. Or there, there's purpose behind the things that I'm doing. So I, I don't understand why anybody else wouldn't do those things. And, and that's what we, we hope to see. But, you know, there is that space for those different answers. We, um, I, I, y'all may know I have a, a day job. I work in IT security. Um, we, we had a, a daily scrum. I don't know if people not in tech have scrums, but this is like a quick stand up. What are you going to do today? Like kind of what your high priorities, everything like that. And just to, you know, like an icebreaker, they asked, Oh, what are you going to be doing for, for this long weekend? And, you know, the, the guys are talking, oh, I'm going to have a dinner party or, you know, I'm going to go skiing. I was like, that's nice. <laughs> but but I, I piped up and I said, I'm considering doing the traditional chopping down of a cherry tree. <laughs> Esoteric joke, George Washington's birthday. Nobody got it. <laughs> it was that awkward silence of just like, oh, they have... Do they know George? Do they know this? <laughs> is this is this a dad joke? Am I just too cheesy for them? Like, now you don't want to get into all that because you just have this brief time. So I'm like, you know, may, maybe that didn't land well, and that's fine. I can appreciate it. But all of that to say, one person's sense of humor may not be for everyone. One person's answer as to why may not be for everyone. Um, but all the things matter, and I want you to hear as to why. Um, yeah. There are very few rules and regulations on what we do as a church. You, you may not know that, but the, the Bible's not very descriptive on, on how you run a Sunday morning service. Um, so biblically, we, we have a lot of, of ground that we can actually walk, work through, and that, that's really my, my hope and joy for this, is that are we looking more like the world, or are we looking more like the kingdom to come? Um, do, does it accomplish the purpose that we set out for when we do these things? And if it doesn't, there's other things I'd rather do. And, and that's just the, the absolute truth of the matter. Like, I, I know church can be boring to some and everything like that, but if it has reason, if there's potential behind it, if it's accomplishing those purposes, let's do it. If there's a way to sharpen that spear and to find a different way, well, let's do that. And I don't care if it looks different than everything else. If we find a better way to express the gospel hope and to realize the truth of what we're about here, then that's all that I want us to be about. Um, this week, I'm combining two things. I'm not trying to get through more topics more quickly because I think that these two things I'm talking about this morning come from the same root. Um, you know that, that whole thing, Hitchhiker's Guide, the, what is the answer to life, the universe, and everything? 42. Well done. Proud of you. Good. Yes. Um, but the funny thing is that we don't know the question for that, right? That's the whole joke of the book, if you don't know, is that, is that the answer is 42, and then they say, well, what's the question then? And they're like, oh, that's going to take a long time to figure out what the question is. So we had the answer before the question. And so in that vein, that's kind of what I want you to understand. I'm going to, I'm going to paint the picture as to why, and then I'm going to tell you how the things that, that we're talking about here apply to that. It's a circuitous route, so if you only hear one thing, hear this next sentence, and then you can be dismissed if you want. Um, but I'm going to stay here and keep talking. So do what you want to do with that. But the answer is this. 
because I think we need to encounter the living God on his terms. We need to, and he wants us to. That's the reason why, is that we need to encounter the living God on his terms. We need to, and he wants us to. So here, here's the setup for this. As the church, and, and I've given this a lot of thinking, I, this was a throwaway point in one of my sermons like seven years ago, and I think if I write a book, this has got to be a big part of it. But we as the church, I believe, are distributors of grace. That might sound strange. It's not language I think we use a lot, but, but that's why we do what we do, is we distribute grace to a world that needs it. So all that we do, whether it's exploring the truth of the gospel, whether it's doing ministry, whether it's praying for those, whether it's providing financial need for those who need it, right? All of the things that we're doing, we're distributing grace. And whenever we realize that it's not our grace, but his, we're not the manufacturers of the grace, we're not the ones who can make this stuff up, but we are distributing his grace, the Father's grace, to a world that needs it. All of a sudden, a lot of what I do takes on a different shape, right? If, if, my, if our entire thing was to distribute food, <laughs> right, then why are we doing anything else? Why are we even talking about just, just get food out there, right? But there's more to it than that. If, if the only point of the church was to, to sing songs to, to pr- please God, right, then why are we doing anything else? It's just be worship all the time, you know, everything for that. But what we're doing in everything that we do whether it's caring for the poor, whether it's exploring the word, whether it's, it's worshiping the Lord, we're distributing grace. So we are not the originators, but grace is a meal that we continually need. Grace is a meal we continually need. I, I think we overwhelmingly think of grace as not being punished for our sins, right? When I say God's grace, amazing grace, that's probably the idea that comes to mind. It's like, oh yeah, I've been forgiven. And that's not wrong, but I think it's an incomplete kind of idea is where we're coming from. Those who have been around the church for a while, you might hear these these things and say, oh, no, that's mercy, right? And like, oh, yes, I know where you're coming from. The, the, we've, we've done good word studies throughout the, the decades in the church here. And, and we get statements like this, mercy is not getting what we deserve, and grace is getting what we don't deserve. And it's pithy. It's good. It's based in truth. There's nothing wrong with this. But I feel personally like that doesn't necessarily tell me the whole picture of it. Um, you may know this, you may not. My daughter's name is Karis. One of my daughter's name is Karis. Karis is Greek for grace. Um, it's a very intentional meaning. Uh, we did not know if we'd be able to have children. And uh, whenever we found out that my wife was pregnant, it was a grace from the Lord. It was a gift from him. And I think of that whenever I call her, whether it's out of pleasure or frustration, <laughs> I'm still calling on the Lord's grace and saying, thank you, God, for the gifts that you have given us. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. There's a small addition that, that some people add to this, that judgment is getting what we do deserve. And well, I, I think that that kind of is helping us with some ways. I, I have a problem with it because I actually do believe, and, and this is one of those things where there might be some different people in the room, and that, that's fine, but I think it's important that I say this. I think it's justice for the Christian to be a co-heir with Christ. That's a bold statement if you think about it. If I'm saying we don't deserve that judgment any longer, but we deserve to be co-heirs with Christ, not because of our own merit, but because of the price that was paid for us, because of the love of God for us, I actually find that that's more God-honoring than the, the, the woe is me and, and we're terrible and we deserve all the judgment, which is also true, <laughs> but there's more to that story because we're not left there. It's not that the price is paid and then we just leave it as that. The idea is that we are actually worthy of celebration, that the life is lived to the full and it, it's justice for us to spend that time with the Lord because he wants us there. <laughs> because he said, you're worthy to be in my presence. So, so even though we can understand judgment as kind of a third part of this, I feel like that's just telling you the front, front half of a story. So it's, it's hard, I think, to leave it at that point. It's not because of our worth, but then because of his. So what is grace really? Uh, unmerited favor, sure. Luke 2.52, Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. That word favor is grace. It's charis. And that might be not where we expect that word, but this is where I want you to start understanding that the grace is more than just saying you're forgiven. It's increasing in favor 
It's increasing in the fact that the Lord looks on you with pleasure and with respect and with a desire to see these good things come about. So Jesus, as he grew, he increased in favor with God and man. It's also a very bold theological thing that I think we don't like to think about is that he increased in favor. He increased in grace with God and with man. That's for another Sunday. (laughs) But let me explain something extremely profound to me about this. All right. We talk about the gifts in the church a lot, right? We talk about the gifts of healing, the gift of tongues. We talk about the gift of prophecy. They mean a lot to us in the vineyard. The word gift, though, is a weird translation. The word gift in Scripture is grace. You get a gracelet. It's, it's like you get it. It's, it's charismata is the word. It's like a manifestation of grace. So anytime that there's healing, anytime that there's prophecy, anytime that these profound things happen, it's a manifestation of God's grace. And I, I don't think we think that way. I, I think what we assume is I've earned this gift or we, we think that I now possess something. But when we can understand that, that grace is somehow being made manifest to me here, I think it changes our approach to exploring what it means to be spirit-filled, what it means to be a church that's active in the spiritual gifts. So this is from uh, 1 Corinthians 12. There are different kinds of gifts. There are different kinds of gracelets. All right, and if you understand that, this is going to make sense, but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. Because what we need is to see the spirit made manifest. What we want to see is the goodness of God in tangible form. What we want is to know that his presence is for our benefit. So, Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there's given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between Spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one, just as he determines. His grace is spread out for the benefit of us all. There's a manifestation that you have that I need, and there's a manifestation I have that you need, where we make the kingdom of God something that you can come to and sink your teeth into and understand. That's the beauty of this whole understanding. All of a sudden, it's, we're not talking about powers. We're not talking about the fact that I can wield my muscles and, and do whatever I need to do. We're talking about the fact that God's kingdom is something that we can interact with. It's something that we can see, something that we can, can have some exchange with. If it's a gift, I feel like I've earned it, or if I could lose it, or maybe that it's mine to do with whatever I want to whenever I want to. And I got to tell you, I've spent years trying to, to manifest the gifts as I want them to. It has not been very fruitful. And what's frustrating is whenever I, I'm operating in the gifts, the, the, the one that, that happens to me more often than others is probably wisdom, maybe in my parenting, maybe in counseling, in these pastoral moments. But all of a sudden, like, I open my mouth and something comes out. And I'm thinking, oh, was, that was good. I should write that down. <laughs> and I could never have told you in advance what I was going to say. And, and this, is, this sounds weird to you, maybe. I don't know if you operate in this gift as well. Maybe you can understand exactly what I'm talking about. But it's like all of a sudden, when the need is before me, and I, I've been in a place where I'm asking for this, the Lord makes this present. He makes it a reality. He calls it together. He gives it breath. And all of a sudden, there's wisdom in the room. And it's startling to me. If I, could, if I could make that happen myself, I would probably write that book that I was telling you about earlier that I would write. And I, I could control this and it would be all that, that, that success that we would want. I, I think that this is one of the reasons why healing ministry is so hard and why it's so filled with people that are, are false representations of this. Because what we want to do is we want to do it on our own terms. We want to make sure that, that I can do it. And, and this is the way it should look. And I want it to be like that. But it's a manifestation of the kingdom of God coming when we need it. When I read this as a manifestation of grace, it does a few things. It keeps my eyes on him. It keeps me recognizing his character. 
and it keeps me hungering and thirsting to come back for more. Because if it's a gift, I'm prone to try to treat that as the end all of what I need. And I'm going to try to be self-sufficient. And I know myself, I won't be going back to the source. I'm not going to stay in a place of humility. I'm not going to stay in a place of relationship. I'm going to be like, oh, my daughters are sick, be healed. You know, (laughs) whatever it might be. Because we think that I can just do all this stuff myself whenever I want to. And again, I can't speak about how everybody else's gifts operate. This is how it works for me. Our whys might be slightly different on here, but... I've never been anybody but Josh. So this is what I've come to find in my own life. It keeps me hungering and coming back for more. So if that's grace, what do I mean by distributing it? What do I mean when I say that the church is meant to be distributors of grace? I mean that we can realize that, that all we do in the church is connect people to these moments of manifestations. That's what we do. And all that we do from the moment that we set foot in here, we're trying to connect people with a manifestation of God's grace. If you know about the, the sacraments, it's a similar idea, but I'm going to argue that, that that's maybe less biblical and, 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 uh, and, and this is uh, less formal than, than that, that sacraments. But the sacraments are understood as these ways that we encounter the goodness of God, be it through baptism, be it through marriage, be it through all these other things. But here too, it's, it's all of this. It's through the prophetic, it's through the healing, it's through the table, it's through the prayers of the saints, it's through all the things that we do when we come together. It's a manifestation of God's grace. How can I bless this world with opportunities to encounter God's grace? That's the question before us. How can I bless this world with these opportunities to encounter a manifestation of God's grace? See, I I think what's happened is since the Enlightenment, here's American history for you a little bit, all right? Since the Enlightenment, we've jumped the gun on truth and judgment. We got an answer. (laughs) We like this way of thinking because we can hold it into our heads, and it's self-sufficient. Once I have a truth in my head, then I'm like, aha, (laughs) I've connected those dots, and I can always connect those dots, and those dots are connected, and therefore I'm going to try to make those dots get connected for everyone. And we, we got to this idea of truth, and it's not wrong. And then as soon as you have truth, you reach and you, the, the next best friend you have to truth is often judgment. Because all of a sudden, I know that if those dots aren't connected for you, then they're not connected. And I know that they should be. So therefore, that's a problem. <laughs> and therefore, judgment is a, is a quick tool that I have right on the heels of truth. And I think that that's led us to so many practices where we've not made the table central, where we've not made grace and mercy the next best friend to truth, but we've made judgment the next best friend. And this is, I think, explaining a lot of why we've done the things that we have. This is, this is going to be a little bit deep. You got to track with me a little bit. Hold with me. I, I think this is going to be pretty good. Um, but here's what I want you to hear. The Bible is very clear on this. We are not good at judging. In fact, we're explicitly told to not do it. This is Matthew 7. Do not judge. Okay, like that's enough right there. Don't judge. Like he knows the way that we are. He knows that when you get truth, he knows that you just, it's like, oh, it's right there. Like it feels so tangible. It feels good. It feels right. It's so close to something because we know that this truth is meaningful to us. And it is. That's what this keeps telling us. Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye? Pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. How can you say to your brother, let me take this speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Huge moment of revelation for me when I didn't try to disconnect that part about pearls and pigs from what he's talking about with judgment. Because judgment is good. It's a precious pearl. And God does it well and we do it poorly. <laughs> and whenever we try to judge, it's a, it's a poor representation of this good and beautiful thing because when the Lord judges, he judges with justice, with mercy, with grace. And when we judge, we judge really poorly. It's, 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 it's often too severe or less severe. It's often not met with the love and the kindness and the gentleness, his kindness that leads us to repentance. Those things are often absent 
because we have truth and we know what is so close to that. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Therefore judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He's going to do it better. He's going to do it better. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. There we see grace and mercy right away. Now, again, I want to underscore, justice and judgment are actually really, really good things when done well. But when we try to sit on that throne, when we try to be in that place, it's a mockery of the things that are of God. It, it's another big revelation to me. I, I do believe that, that taking the Lord's name in vain is something that, that we talk about as if you, you use the name of the Lord as, a, as an expletive. I, I do believe that. But so much of the time, too, and I think a lost meaning in our society is when we attribute things to the Lord, things that are not. When we say the Lord says when the Lord did not say. Whenever we say the Bible says this when the Bible does not say that, and we are using the Lord's name in vain, we're attaching the label of Christ, we're attaching the name of the Father to things that are serving our own agenda. And in that vein, the church is often more at fault for taking the Lord's name in vain whenever we're saying, this is what the Lord told us to do, and look at this, and give us all your money, and we're going to do all these things about this, and the Lord's doing this, and the Lord's doing that, go over here, go over there. That's taking the Lord's name in vain. May we take it so seriously when the Lord calls us to do something. This is why, by the way, we have the prophetic cards. Because we believe in the prophetic. We believe God speaks. I believe you hear the Lord's voice. I believe you can. And I don't want to treat that so loosely that if the Lord is actually saying something, we're just like, well, what did he say? I don't know. (laughs) It was just a, a momentary thing. How dare we take the Lord's word so loosely that we don't pay attention to when he speaks. So we want to press in. If you write something on that card, we discern it. We pray over it. We want to see, is this something for us to change? Is this something for us to, to look at? Is this something for us to, to try to, to hold to a higher regard? It, it's not trying to make it so that, that you don't have to tell us in person. And I think that's how some people thought is like, oh, we're trying to control. No, no, no. We, we have a folder <laughs> at home with all the wor- prophetic word cards in there. It matters to us because if it's the Lord, if it's him supernaturally speaking to his people, well, why don't we care about that, right? May we treat it with the honor and the dignity as the pearls deserve rather than just tossing them away to go into the wind. I think this, whenever we're thinking about that 1 Corinthians 4, 5 passage, judge nothing before the appointed time, the longer it takes Christ to come again, I think it makes more and more theological sense. Because he wants all to come to know him. He wants all to have a chance to hear the truth. He wants all to be saved and to live life to the full. He's a good father. He's a good father. The longer it takes him to come back, it's like the next generation gets to hear it a little bit more clearly. And you who has already experienced grace, you get to live your life out fully in in the pleasure of knowing the goodness and grace of God. It makes more sense to me the longer that this is going to take. I'm now one of the uh, elder ones around the office, which is not so comfortable always, Uh, sometimes around the church as as well. And you see the next generation coming in, and and I I, I hear sometimes the things that people say, like where they haven't learned certain things in the office, they don't know how to do these things, and it's like, oh, bless your heart. (laughs) And that's not a dig at anybody, because there's, there's value of pressing through these things and coming to the other side of them. I was a very judgmental 20-year-old. I was. I thought I had all the answers. I thought I understood all these things. I thought I understood it all. But as I sat with the word of God, grace has done a deep work with me. And, And this is, I think, the encouragement of those who are further down the road than what you might be, right? Is that when you sit with the word of God, it will accomplish its job. And it carves out these channels of grace that looks so different than what I thought it was at at, at first. And here's the weird thing about it. It's not that it was wrong when I was 20. It's just the fact that there was more to be done. There's more beauty to be revealed. The longer I spend in God's presence, the longer I spend spend saturated in his word, hopefully the more Christ-like I become, and hopefully the more of a manifestation of his grace we get to be to this world. Judgment is quick, and it's often severe. But I found that given time, grace carves a beautiful path. James 2.13, 
because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. I, there's a song the Vineyard wrote, uh, Mercy Triumphs Over Judgment. I don't remember thinking the very first time, that's not biblical. <laughs> because God's judgment is perfect. Because, you know, because I knew that God's judgment is perfect. And so how could something triumph over God's judgment? It, it, it made no sense to me. And I, I leaned over to somebody, I forget who it was at this point in time. I was like, that can't be right. What, what? I, I, my theological, you know, spidey sense is tickling. And I'm like, I, I know, I know all the right answers. And that can't be, and he goes, James 2.13. I was like, oh no, I'm wrong. <laughs> because mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. I, I, it, it's profound. And the more that I say it, the more I sit with it. it. It's troubling to me in so many ways, but it's so beautiful to me in other ways. God is not at war with himself. This is a whole other sermon that we're not going to get into today. God is not at war with himself, but this is the beautiful expression that we have to express what happens in salvation. Mercy triumphs over judgment. We get just that little taste of truth, and I don't mean knowledge, we start applying it everywhere. We tasted the knowledge of good and evil, and like the hammer, everything is a nail. We reach for what is close and easy, and judgment seems to be the next step, not mercy. If we have the temperance of the Lord, when we reach for the next thing that's akin to truth, we'll find mercy, because mercy triumphs over judgment. And it's not just in the church. I, I don't like to get political or, or social with my commentary um, as a rule, but I think what's stirring me is, is that as the church, the, the wise behind all this stuff, we have to be different than the world. Like the, the reason that this thing matters, the reason that I want to be a pastor, the reason that, that I think the kingdom come means something to the world is because we are different. If we just have a, a quiet inward faith that, that's just to save our soul one day eventually when we get to, to heaven. And by the way, you should listen to Leah's sermon if that's the way you're thinking. That, that's not the case. But if you think that way, then, then you, we, you just don't want to make any waves. You know, just, just keep it private. Just keep it personal and that'll be enough. But if we actually believe that this stuff is, first of all, true, secondly, relevant, third, revolutionary to shape the world to be a better place, how dare we keep it to ourselves? I mean, how dare we not distribute this grace which has touched us? How dare we be like, that's grace for me. I don't know what's going to work for you. Well, it's a manifestation of the same grace. Maybe you'll find it in the gift of healing. Maybe you'll find the gift of prophecy. Maybe you'll find it when you open the word of God. Maybe you'll find it at the communion table. But you need a manifestation of God's grace. And as the church, we are called to, to distribute that so that you can actually come to an encounter with the risen Lord. So here's an example <laughs> of, of why I think this stuff does matter. I was listening to a, one of my podcasts, Leo would be laughing at me right now, and I was hearing about how they combated drug usage throughout the 1800s in England. I don't know what podcast you listen to, but that's what my podcasts were talking about. And what was very interesting is they were not talking about it as a criminal issue, but as a healthcare issue. That changed everything that followed. People were not criminals that they were trying to, to deal with by putting them behind bars. They were patients who needed to be treated. And that perspective shift, just from that very first point, changed how society related to people that were addicts. It changed to how the social programs followed after that. And what I think, what, this is the same problem that we've had from the Enlightenment. Are drugs bad? Yes. <laughs> so therefore, they should be illegal. Makes sense, right? So therefore, if you do drugs or sell drugs, you should be in jail. That's the, that's the hammer that we have for that. It makes logical sense. But we've been struggling with this as a society. We see so many criminalizations. We see so many problems that are cascading from this accurate judgment because we don't understand all the tools that we have at our hands. I'm not advocating for the, the decriminalization of drugs. That, like I said, I'm not going to get political and social all up in here. But what I want to say is whenever we understand the full manifestations of grace that are possible, when we understand that, for instance, whenever we have a crisis and you're not scared that the cops are going to come throw me to jail, but when you have the expectation that there could be somebody here to care for my mental health, there could be an EMS, there could be a firefighter, all crises are not one size fits all. All problems are not slap some truth onto that and go off to the races. 
Sometimes the manifestation that we need is absolute truth. So many times the manifestation of grace that we need is the table. Sometimes the manifestation that we need is when our physical bodies need healing. What I'm saying is, as a society, I think we still struggle with this, and the church should not follow that example. The church should understand the fullness of the gospel, the fullness of the gifts of God, the fullness of the distribution of grace to a world that needs it for whatever circumstances, for whatever situations come up to us. So with the church, I'm going to read it again. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. To one, there's given through the spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Sometimes I need wisdom. Sometimes I need knowledge. Sometimes I need healing. Sometimes I need faith. But it is all grace. We get confused, I think, because the manifestation is often communal. It's through one another, because we partner with the Holy Spirit, because we partake in the incarnation, which is a whole other big topic for another day, because it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So am I the giver or the receiver? Is it for me or is it through me? And it's both, and it's often at the same time when things are working well. So in the vineyard, something that makes us unique that we do is something that we call ministry time. It's not an altar call. It's not a closing prayer. We have the belief that God wants to take care of his people still today in profound and often miraculous ways. That's our belief. So why do we do this at the end of every service? Every service, we say, come forward if you need prayer. This is not to be nice to you. (laughs) This is not just because it's like some cultural thing. It's because I can't heal you, but if the Lord is going to show up, I can participate in that healing. It's because sometimes the word of God stirs something in your soul and you need to do something about that. And this is how we have best found we can participate in and enjoy that manifestation. It's not meant to be counseling. It's not that you come up here and you share with what's, what's going wrong with your week and we pat you on the head and say, better luck next time, kid. <laughs> That's not what we're doing. We are attempting to actively participate in the redemption of all things that all things can be made new, that we can behold what love can do. That's what we're doing whenever we're having a call to ministry time. We have these things in in nice and neat boxes. Um, The philosophical stuff, right? Turn the other cheek. The meek will inherit the earth, right? That's one category of, of, of truth that we have. Then we have the theological stuff, right? Your sins can be forgiven. Jesus is the son of God. Okay, great. That's a a second bucket. Then there's that supernatural stuff, right? Healing, the prophetic, resurrection. People sometimes have box one or two or three, but maybe not all of them, because sometimes the churches just get confused about what to do with these other things that just seem weird, right? Jesus, it seems, had no boxes, and he actively mixed up the categories as well as he wanted every time it came up. This is from Matthew 9. Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. Some men brought him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Here's a physical need. He meets it with a theological point. (laughs) At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, This fellow's blaspheming. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or say, Get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, get up, take your mat, and go home. Then the man got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe. They praised God, who had given such authority to man. Not to to Jesus. (laughs) To man. He gave this authority to man, because we are called to participate in the same 
ministry. And all of this stuff, these neat boxes that we have, I, I go to church and I just, I just want you to tell me that it'll be okay. Just give me a nice message or give me some wisdom that I can just think, okay, I'll do something a little different this week. I don't know if I want to get into all this weird stuff. I don't know if I want to deal with a, a God who is actually changing things and shaping this world. I don't think we get to make that call. That's the, the hope. That's the challenge. That's the fearsome reality of a living God is we don't get to make that call. When the Holy Spirit shows up, we might not get what we're looking for, but we're going to get what he has for us. And it's such a good gift to be that way, to say, when you come up here, it's not that I'm going to give you my best wisdom. I'm not going to give you just my best thoughts, but I'm going to pray that the Lord will show up and have an exchange with you today because that's way better than anything I could give you. That's our hope. That's why we do this. People with good intentions, even if you come up here in our church, may try to give you good and godly counsel, and hopefully that is what it is, but that's not why we're trying to do this time. Ministry time is somebody saying, I'm willing to try and intercede with you for you to our God, because sometimes you, sometimes I have a hard time hearing. Sometimes somebody else can hear perfectly well. Sometimes you, sometimes I have a hard time believing, and somebody else is doing great at that moment. But always, it's exploring not what we can do if we can formulate the perfect prayer and flex our, our faith muscle so that it's bulging and impressive, but is exploring the way to the kingdom and exploring the ways of the king. That's what we're doing when we have ministry time. And then we have the table. It's a small point of, of words, but we don't take communion, we receive it. It's not our table, it's his. I believe we are called to set our tables, like your table in your house, after the same model that the Lord sets his table. I think that this is a grace that we practice in the church that you are meant to go and replicate elsewhere. The same way with the gifts. You're meant to replicate the table of the Lord with your own grace, with your own powers, with the own provision that you have for your friends, for your family, for your neighbors. The primary point I made in the beginning we need to encounter the living God on his terms. We need to, and he wants us to. I believe the table should be central because it leans not on our own understanding or our own effort. This is where we come to the Father on his terms, by his, self, by his invitation, by his provision in a manner that pleases him. He said, come. <laughs> he said, by my blood, by my body, come. How could we not? Why would we try to find another way? This is the means of grace made manifest to us through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. It's a manifestation of grace that we can, as a church, participate in together. We're able, literally, to set the, the table. We're, we're literally able to put the things out, as he told us to, in a way to explore that grace for us as often as we do it. What an incredible invitation. This is why I think it should be central. Because everything else we're doing, we're trying to do that same exact point. Everything that we're trying to do, trying to make grace manifest, the table is already there for us. It's that idea of saying, the Lord has made a way. Let's see it. Let's put it into practice. Let's realize what this means. And we try and craft our, our own approaches. We try to not use the table. right? I like those heist movies where they, they pick a spot for wherever the meetup's going to be, right? And you know that they, they scout it out beforehand. They make sure that they have a good entrance point, a good exit point, and they have the advantage. They have the high ground, whatever it is, the, the getaway path. Because I think we try to do the same thing in the faith. We try to make sure we have the advantage. We try to make sure that my works are good enough, that my, my appearance is sufficient. We try to make sure that, that, that the scales are, are weighted out in just the, the right way, that, that I'm not embarrassed. I don't feel too much shame. I'm not using too much grace. I'm only using the amount of grace that, that is warranted for me, right? Because I don't want to take too much of that. I don't want to be so bad that I need grace and everybody around me knows that I need grace. And so we try to use as little as possible. We try to work our way around the table. We defend ourselves with our own works. We come and excuse ourselves by pointing out that we're better than someone else. In false humility, we try and come in quietly without disrupting things, without using too much. Or on the flip side, we come in recklessly and carelessly, asserting ourselves and our positions, keeping sins personal and unrepented, 
not dealing with our brothers and sisters in a way that would please the Father. There's only one way to come to the table. It's by grace. The grace extended by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. This is the manifestation of grace. And unlike ministry time where there's so much that we cannot guarantee, we have something that we can do to set the table. The same way that the the word of God is a manifestation of grace and we can open those pages and seek the Lord, we set this table and seek him. There's still no guarantee. You know, you could just come to this table, eat some bread, drink some juice, and move on with your life as if nothing happened. And I know people have done that. But this is why I try every week to explore some different approach to this table. Because anything could happen when we encounter God's grace. I, I, I legitimately believe that. I legitimately believe that you could have a moment of spirit-filled excess taking communion. I, I believe that you can know finally, finally that that hurt, that that wounding that you've been carrying with you since your childhood is actually no longer an issue. I know that you can come here and you can finally see your friends, your neighbors, not as the enemy, but as somebody who needs to have God's grace distributed to them. Your perspective can be changed. I believe that if you need healing in your body, if you need healing from anxiety, depression, if you have mental health issues, I believe when you take communion, you can encounter God's grace in a way that that goes beyond saving you and heals you in every way that you need because we're encountering the risen Lord. It's not about what's on this table. It's about what's behind the table. It's about who invited us. It's about what happens when we're in his presence. This is a manifestation of the goodness of God who came and made his dwelling with us and said, I will come again. It's profound that he made a way as often as you do this. So come to the table. Receive a manifestation of his grace. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take communion. We're going to do ministry time. That's it. Because I legitimately believe it's all we ever want to do. This is the, the answer 42 behind all things. You know, th- this is why we do things, because God wants to be known. We should come to him on his terms, on the way that he made for us. Mm-hmm.